Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. Uh, the time is here for us to begin. And so we'll begin with a couple of opening comments before we do our traditional um, opening prayer, Pledge of Allegiance. The uh, thing I wanted to ask you to consider as part of your thought process today is the fact that we just celebrated another birthday of our country. And I thought Margaret or staff did a nice job picking out some quotable quotes about the 4th of July. The two that I thought were particularly good was that fellow Missourian Harry Truman always comes through in a pinch. He came up with, America was not built on fear. America was built on courage, on imagination, and on unbeatable determination to get the job done. That's pretty profound. And the other one came from another, no, not a native uh, Missourian, but from the Bible. The Bible, Galatians 5.13, for you have been called to live in freedom. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. And that's a whole lot of stuff just wrapped up in those two quotes that I'd like to ask you to just consider sometime during the week. With that, we'll call the meeting to order. It's now 10.02. And ask those who are able to stand for the opening prayer and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name with grateful hearts. You are so good to us, and we take so much for granted. We ask you to be with all of those family members and friends, residents, staff, who have someone in their family who is going through a difficult time. We ask you to reach out to that person and that family and comfort them. Give them the strength to know that you're always with them. We ask you to bless Merrimack Bluffs as we continue to seek to serve each other as well as the community. We ask you to bless the staff. Thank you for their work and their more important diligence in taking care of a group of people like us. And so now we ask you to join us in this time of together of fellowship. We ask you to continue to watch over us and keep our country safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. We're going to do something very similar to what we did uh, with previous guest speakers. We're going to go ahead and do the guest speaker part. That way guests who need to leave a little bit early can do that. Uh, when when uh, Specialist Cox um, is finished with his remarks, we'll have Q&A time. And after Q&A, then I will take over and announce that it's time for visitors, if they wish to, step out in the lobby and talk to Specialist Cox about his remarks or his family. <laughs> gotcha, Margaret. <laughs> Anyhow, so with that, this meeting is uh, uh, officially established, and we are welcoming Specialist Cox back. He came here and visited, what, about three years ago, I guess, right after he started, uh, joined the Army. And we had the Veterans Committee had a chance to sit and visit with him at that, at that time. You have a biographical sketch, I hope, uh, with two pictures, one the dress photo and also the combat gear. And I told Margaret, I said, every soldier's got to have one of each, one in combat gear and one in dress suit. So his bio is before you. I will not repeat it. But he's a fine young man. And my opportunity to visit with him last time he was here, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me and I hope for him. So let's wa give uh, Specialist Cox a nor warm Merrimack Bluffs welcome. Okay. Morning, morning. Got my notes here, awesome. Thank you for coming, thank you for coming. Uh, so, I thank my mom for allowing me to speak today, 
and all you guys to come out and listen to me because I want to share some funny and hilarious stories for you. And uh, yeah, absolutely, let's get started. So the Army hasn't changed. It is still hurry up and uh, wait. So that's still, still a thing for sure. Uh, so I grew up in Hillsborough, Missouri. And I was uh, very much an introverted child. Uh, but my senior and junior year, I definitely became more extroverted, like more hilarious, like everyone liked me. I was doing more sports. I was doing uh, wrestling. I was doing cross country and track so I can prepare for the Army. And that helped uh, very much a lot. Absolutely made some great friends, great stories. Ap like <laughs> we messed around. We were hooligans for sure. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, they named me Dan the Man because they expected me that in the military that I would obliterate armies of dudes somehow. I don't know how, but they, they expected that of me. And uh, I, I did absolutely great. Uh, so at the military recruiting station, my dad wanted me to write an essay of why I wanted to join the military. I wrote a 13-page essay for my dad of why I wanted to join the military. And uh, he absolutely loved it and I'm in the military now. Awesome. Uh, so my training was in Fort Benning, Georgia. So humid, way humid. It was hot. So uh, I did it in the summer through August, so the hottest time, time frame. Uh, I did OSIT, which was is one station unit training, and it's where that I do all my training at that one base. And uh, the my shark attack, or the event where they welcome you to the, your training is uh, they drove us around to build up tension like before anything happens they made us ride in, the, in this bus like oh where are, we, where are we going where are we going and then finally we stopped at this one hill and then uh, these it, was, it got all quiet like ominous and then drill sergeants start running up like sprinting and you, you go like are they saying anything and they bang on the window <laughs> get off the bus and they run run up and they give you a warm welcome of yelling and they say get off the bus get off the bus and absolutely that's that's uh the welcome at fort benning and then uh what you have to do is run up this hill grab your bags and then go back down the hill and then place your bags down and then you just uh, get some physical training uh, as you would say of of just smoke fest what I mean by that is you're just sweating. You're, you're basically making a pool of your own sweat of how much uh, they're working you out at, at basic. And then uh, they said, uh, once you go to the PX, don't buy a Kit Kat. A K Kit Kat like candy, king-sized. And later on, I uh, broke that rule. I didn't even know I did. I was buying it for a buddy, and I broke that, bought it for a buddy, and then uh, I got the whole platoon smoked for it. What I mean by smoked is corrective training. And I had to apologize to every single one, saying, oh, I didn't mean to buy that for a buddy, and then saying, I'm sorry I messed you up there. <laughs> awesome. So that was my uh, Fort Benning training, was pretty much just smoking and learning amazing things from my drill sergeants. They're all, they definitely were mentors most of the time. They did absolutely amazing. Uh, after Fort Carson, I went, I went Fort Benning, I went to Fort Carson, which is 4th ID in Colorado Springs, Colorado. An amazing place, it's right next to Pikes Peak, so you have tons of things to do in the mountains and in Colorado Springs. Uh, I went to 223 Infantry Brigade. I am part of the infantry, I'm there now. Uh, this place has amazing gyms, amazing uh, physical uh, training that you can do. There's it's extraordinary of how much gear they have for the amount of soldiers on this base. Uh, food and nutrition, it is a buffet now at, uh, at the DFAC or dining facility for soldiers. It's not just this rationed food, it is a buffet. You are treated as professional athletes in the Army now, which is amazing. And then uh, I went to the sniper tryouts. Later on, I was like, man, I don't want to be this normal infantry dude. I want to do something way cooler. And I went to sniper tryouts, and I passed. I made it look easy. And then the uh, next thing that I did was a national training center, which is in Death Valley, which is super hot, 
super, super hot. Like you wake up sweating, like you, you, you're sweating the whole time. And it was the hottest time ever, like ever in Death Valley is when we went to uh, NTC or the National Training Center. Pe there was four confirmed people that passed away, which is very sad from that weather and that heat out there. Uh, next thing that happened was, because everyone's so grumpy, everyone's drinking hot water and being sweat out of their minds, trying to stay in the shade. Uh, w when we were eating, uh, one of my buddies accidentally was, uh, they said, hey, could you pass me uh, a sauce packet? And then he said, yeah, and then s smacked his face and then fell down and everyone got quiet and that was a very intense moment. So that was like everyone was just grumpy at each other, which shouldn't have happened, but we all did good. Uh, next thing was uh, at NTC, everyone was trying to sleep. So when we went up to a mountain to observe as snipers and watch this valley and not to allow any uh, hostile uh, movement to go through this valley, uh, in the morning we had to break down because that, or we had a new task that needed to be completed. Uh, we saw the scouts, which is who we were partnered with, were just sleeping on their other hilltop. Just <laughs> and we all just laughed at them and then said, hey, wake up. And they all, they all jumped up and were freaked out, like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? And that's, that's very normal. Everyone was just exhausted. And then uh, moving on, I finally got to our deployment to Iraq. So that's uh, in the biography. I went to uh, Baghdad, Iraq, and I was at the embassy. The embassy is like a small city. It was completely self-sustaining. Like if everything broke, uh, turned off and there was no power in Baghdad, it was, it, the embassy could last on its own. It could be sieged and they do well. Food was even better than Fort Carson. It was, it's State Department. Of course it's, it's gonna be better than the Army, so. Uh, the, they have an outdoor and indoor pool at the Baghdad Embassy, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, my task there at the Baghdad Embassy was to do counter observations, because what if there's spies out there trying to look at our embassy and do something? That was our, one of my tasks. My other task was counter sniper, because I'm a sniper, I'm looking for snipers. And then that's what was my other task. And then VIP Overwatch, which was when like some cool guy landed in uh, the helipad, I would perform overwatch for that and see if there's any uh, hostile intent. No, that was my task. Like there was pretty much nothing else uh, out there that I did was just work out, eat, sleep, and work. And I did. I, I had enough time to even do college classes out there, and that was the that was the, the most of my time was college classes, no sleep, pretty much. Uh, networking. I had amazing networking out there. There were some hilarious people out there that uh, really were uh, wanted the connection with me and to train them up and give them uh, information about my expertise. Uh, networking was with CIA and C uh, State Department. Great, great people out there. Uh, they allowed us to go to ranges because our dudes never allowed us to go to ranges and we were, what I mean by ranges is go shoot long distance, long distance in uh, Iraq. Awesome, and then and, uh, one of our funny stories is that there's a golf cart that we used to whip around. We m were crazy with that thing. We were whipping it everywhere. We were like <laughs> everywhere with that, uh, with the golf cart, and we were very intense, very, very dangerous in that. People could have fallen out. So that's how uh, crazy we were with that golf cart to uh, maneuver around this uh, little small city. Uh, post deployment, so now I'm back here and sharing you uh, that experience. It was uh, the only action that I had over there was just rockets because uh, I didn't see any observers or snipers, but we still had uh, hostile intent with uh, rockets coming in and then drones. There was sometimes drones trying to observe what's inside the embassy, but they failed to get any closer because of our uh, the U.S. defenses. All right, post deployment. So once I got back, I had to start doing my uh, furthering my career. So my goals are to do uh, sniper school. That's going to be this September. The ranger school is going to come up next, and then there's uh, reconnaissance and surveillance leadership course. So that that's going to help me with uh, being a better leader in this scout or uh, recon uh, element that I do. 
And then for a possible reenlistment bonus is Pathfinder, which allows you to land in helicopters uh, wherever you want. You, you have the knowledge to control that, where you need to land, helicopters, any source like that. Uh, going and then awesome. Uh, that's pretty much all that I have. And if you have any questions, there's I absolutely have way great stories. So uh, that's pretty much it for sure. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Number number six is it coming on. Can you hear me in the back? Good. Okay. Questions for uh, Specialist Cox. Okay, Larry. You mentioned that you were trained for long-range sniping. What is considered long-range? What's considered long-range is dependent on the weapon. So we have three weapon types. We have our 110, which is our for rapid engagement. That is our semi-automatic uh, rifle. It's, it's 800 meters shooter dependent, so you can absolutely put it out further than 800 meters, but that's for that rifle. Then we have our 2010, which is a bolt action. 300 wind mag that we utilize for uh, personnel or anti-material, which goes out to uh, 1,200 meters, shooter dependent. That's again, that it can be pushed out further than 1,200 meters, but that's pretty far. And then we have our 107, which is our 50 cal. That is our anti-material rifle. Uh, according to the Geneva, Geneva Convention, we cannot use it on personnel because it's too big of a round. So we uh, use it on material, and that goes out to 1,500 meters, a little less than a mile for that. Shoot it dependent. Okay, other questions? Hello? Wait, wait, for, the, wait for the mic. Thank you. What part of your military career did you enjoy the most, and are you going on for 22 years? Awesome. So the what I enjoy is the the food. The <laughs> absolutely the food is awesome. So uh, the the brotherhood. So we in the sniper section we have a really great brotherhood. Like we are even planning on just living all together at some point, even out of the military, and just doing some hooligan stuff. And then uh, brotherhood, food, and then working out. That is th those those three are really big for me. So. I can assure you that those of us who served some 65 years ago would not say the food was the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then oh, the last question that I missed was my future career in the military. So uh, right now it's just schools and then reenlistment bonus, which hopefully should happen because they're actually down 20,000 people for the Army right now, and they need people. They're really trying to give everything to people that are trying to stay in, so I'll try to uh, acquire that bonus if possible. Ella? Are you able to, are you able to continue your college classes as, as you continue in the service? Yes, uh, so uh, right now I'm just focusing on my upcoming military school, which is sniper school, and then after sniper school, this spring, I should do another college class, and then I'll go to ranger school, so that, that I will definitely try to keep up with my college classes. Other questions one, yeah. over here? Hi, for those of us who don't understand meters, could you convert 1,500 meters to yards? Uh, yes, absolutely, so, uh, so 1,500, so it should be uh, maybe near 1650 yards or around that. Uh, and then 1200 should probably be 13, 1320 maybe meters. And then the 800 meters, so you add, and it uh, should be 900 yards. So 1320 yards, so in that range, that's, that's the distance. Are, did you see anything of the MREs, the packets, the old famous ones? 
Oh, the old, the old famous ones. Uh, so we have new ones. Like there's now pizza in, in these MREs. <laughs> so there's, we, ha we have a bunch of new stuff like hash browns and eggs. And like the, we have, there's quite a bit of new stuff in the MREs. Uh, it's definitely loaded with carbs or a lot of like stuff that can keep you moving. Not really for uh, making gains out in the field or uh, getting uh, much more athletic. It's more to keep you moving. So that's the new MREs. I haven't messed with the old ones. Got another one over here for Dave and then Bob up front, I'll get. As a, as a sniper, do you have anybody who uh, goes with you like uh, an ammunition a helper or something the way they did it years ago? So like for ranges or acquiring ammo for ranges? Uh, if you're in action, uh, somebody to carry your ammunition. Oh yes, absolutely. So. Uh, in we have a sniper, uh, sniper spotter, and then a team leader. That's a team. So we have a team leader, an RTO, to, RTO, and a shooter. So the, we have all those roles, and then we all cross load weight. So no one is like too heavy or too light. We all cross load, so we have it all easier for each other. While we're uh, on that topic, I'll add if one comment. Have you fired a round as a sniper in a hostile situation? No, I have not. Okay, fair enough. Next, David. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, your rank is a specialist. What does that mean? Where are you ranked? A specialist is ranked as an E4 in the military, so it goes uh, private and then PV2 and then a PFC, and then specialist. It's right below sergeant, which is an E5. Okay, thank you. Another question over here from Bob. Do you have any occasion to operate outside the embassy while you were deployed? The only operations that we did outside of the embassy were to go see some like human resources and to go to the, a range which requires more distance than 100 meters or 100 yards. Other questions? Chuck? When you're going to take a long range uh, shot, what are the factors that you have to correct for uh, before you shoot? Absolutely. So with the what we take in consideration, we keep it as simple as possible because if you make it more complicated, that means you need to think more and we don't do that. We already have our dope which what i mean by dope is data on previous engagement that means we go to a range we acquire our dials so the stuff that we take in consideration is elevation windage and then if it's any further than 800 meters then probably the the little tiny spin that goes off with uh, how the bullet rotates it gives a little drift and that's all we utilize in our uh, consideration to engage other questions i've got another one there's one there, Sam. While I wait, keep waiting for Sam, uh, in when I talk to the Pentagon later on, should I tell them to sign you up for 30? <laughs> Margaret, would you like a vote on that? <laughs> okay. wow. Sam, you're up. Uh, how many snipers were at at the embassy? If you can disclose that, I don't know. Absolutely. So we wished we had more. The our unit was not really fair they were we were really spread thin on this deployment they we, they wanted us everywhere and they couldn't get us everywhere so we only had three snipers which was me wilson and uh, sergeant woolsey and we got the job done and we did a lot of hours here chuck uh, you spent your uh, major amount of your time at fort carson which is where i spent my limited uh, Army service. Can't, can't hold the mic a little closer. We can't hear Sorry. you. Sorry, I'm, I'm I was asking about Fort Carson, where I spent uh, my service. I take it from what you just said that uh, Carson is a is a much uh, more much more uh, specialized place now than it was when I was there. Yes, the uh, yes, it has improved. I like. I, is that what you mean? Is it has it improved? Absolutely, it has, it has improved. They're trying to improve it even more, and they're trying to make the uh, lifestyle 
way better for the soldier there. If that, is that what you mean? Awesome. I've got one more, and that is, did you, were you able to take advantage of technology and talk to your folks when you were in Baghdad? Yes. So the, we had Wi-Fi. <laughs> we had Wi-Fi. It was the apartment or housing at the embassy is better than the one in Fort Carson. So we had way better housing, <laughs> which is interesting. When my son was here, he also commented, on his three deployments, he was able to get his soldiers to a internet connection and make contact with their families, which is a significant difference than what most of the people in this room experienced. Other questions for Specialist Cox? Ruth? Coming at you from behind. I'm just wondering if you had any experience with firearms before you went into the Army that gave you perhaps an advantage? So in the Army, they really don't want you to have much experience. But I had uh, quite a little bit, which was with my dad's 22, and that, that was really it. So uh, that's all the experience that I had. And uh, I did, I, it does not uh, influence me to choose sniper. The sniper was just to go somewhere better. I have a question about, the, did you have any kind of training uh, of the impact of, the point of a sniper, I assume, is to take out an enemy object or an enemy person. How much psychological work did they do with you on that? The, none, like, none. none. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, other questions? Got a few more minutes. Specialist Cox, thank you so much for being here with us. We're going to ask you to step out into the hallway. Did we and have those, another question? I'm sorry, you got one over here? Morris? All right, hang on. Morris, I was Delay just that announcement. Uh, I was just curious, you're a specialist in the Army. What division you were in, and I'm raising that from the standpoint that recently I read that they eliminated the 102nd Infantry Division. So that raised a question in my mind since I served in the 102nd. Is there a change in the strategy, the Army, or what, what's going on? So what the Army is trying to do, so we actually kind of pulled away from the insurgency and actually started trying to go back to the way of uh, conventional warfare because of the new threats with China and Russia we are trying to go back to the old conventional ways rather than insur insurgency where it's just going through a town or anything like that we're actually using uh, mechanized and motorized vehicles now the having to do with uh, another activation the army continually uh, drags out of the records books old units and revitalizes them when a mission comes down they'll bring up squadrons, battalions, brigades, divisions, uh, so that the historical aspect of the Army is never lost. Uh, you can track uh, way back to World War II and prior. So it's a different world, but when he says they're short on recruits, that is in fact a matter uh, correct. And you have to think about what's happening in our country. Uh, our uh, leaders over the last three, uh, actually over the last eight years have dumped 12 years worth of budget into our country. Okay, they gave four trillion dollars more than they normally would have in an eight year period. Four trillion takes a lot of spending and there's a lot of money that's still out there waiting to be spent and a lot of kids that know that it's there. And they're not rushing to come to work until they have absolute need. So it's a part of our culture right now that we just have to go through having a period of affluence, more money than we know what to do with. It doesn't buy as much, but that's another problem. So, any other questions? Sam, oh, we've got some more. Prompt some more questions. Hang in there. Did they do any recruiting at Hillsboro High School while you were in high school? Yes, they absolutely did. They, uh, every branch came to that uh, school and they, I, it appears to be they had quite a bit of interest. I was just wondering, um, 
when you get your survival training? At what point in your training? Survival. So the, the new Army uh, training cycle, which is 22 weeks, I received the 14 week. I was one of the last training cycles at Fort Benning to do the 14 week. They actually changed it now to the 22 week and they actually put survival training into uh, training infantry soldiers now. I did not receive survival training or not yet. I haven't gone to SEER school, survival, evasion, uh, the resist and uh, evacuate or yes, pretty much leave, get out of there. <laughs> that was the, that's SEER. Thank you. Okay, last call for other questions. Anybody? All right, as I said before, we are so appreciative of your time and service and the fact that you would take a, a bit of your family time to be with us. So God bless you, and we wish you the, the best of the world. Okay.